Morning, everyone. Thank you very much for coming in today. My name is Alex Smith. What I'm going to be talking about today is a pure play video over the top platform. And what I'll be focusing on is a microservices architecture and building that on AWS. I'll also have a co-presenter, uh, Vidya from Verizon, who will be talking about some of the challenges in building this platform in reality as well. So let's start with what the actual problem is here and what you're trying to address. So nowadays, there are more content choices than ever. More people are moving into video. More people are starting to build platforms. You have an increase in the number of devices. So today, you might have iPhone and Android. You have set-top boxes, Apple TV, Fire TV. You have second screen experiences on various devices. And you also have games consoles, anything connected to a TV. You have various delivery methods, so over the internet, over satellite. And you also have new experiences. I mentioned second screen. What about watch apps? What about the increase in various different connected devices? And at the same time, businesses are changing. You have more data coming in. And you can't just process this in a batch. You can't process this once per day. Now it's got to be real time. You expect to know exactly what's happening right now. Today you launch in Singapore. Tomorrow you have to launch in the US, maybe the week after in Australia. And all of this while having smaller teams. Companies are being bought for millions of dollars with a three-person engineering team. So that huge infrastructure team, the application team, that model no longer works. But you can do all of this while innovating, while failing, while trying and building new things. I want to uh, just set some expectations. With the, expe with the exception of just now, I will not say the phrase content is king, and I will not talk about that side of this. I want this to cover the architecture and building the platforms. I'll talk you through building from scratch an OTT platform. And then, as I mentioned, I'll welcome on stage Vidya, who will deal with the battle-hardened lessons. <clears throat> so to level set, in my previous companies, often there was an argument about OTT versus OVPE, maybe platform differences between AVOD and CVOD and SVOD, and frankly, it doesn't matter. Many of these technologies are the same across all of these. And also, you would have seen I included the word microservices, pure play OTT. I basically hit every buzzword, but microservices for this is not a buzzword. What I mean here is the single purpose or small purpose specific function services and doing this to allow you to rapidly innovate on your platforms and actually build them quicker without having to take into account large amounts of legacy. So when we go through an over-the-top platform, there's a few different components. First of all, you start with ingest. So this is content production, whether this is anywhere from a journalist in a field somewhere uh, with a camera all the way through to post-production, high FX rendering. It's then ingested into a platform stored on a SAN or a NAS commonly. We then move into preparation. This is the encoding, the encryption, any uh, transforming and packaging. We move on to distribution, getting it out to people. This may be B2C, delivered over the internet via a content delivery network, or it may be B2B if you're helping feed other aggregation platforms. And finally, and most importantly, you have the actual consumption whether this is a player, whether this is a client device. And all of this is across a shared infrastructure. Unlike many broadcasters, in an OTT platform or a pure play platform, you don't have the legacy of broadcast equipment. So you can take advantage of the same IT systems, the same infrastructure that may power your corporate website, may power any other system. So I'll start with ingest. And in there, today, in many broadcasters, there's a lot of specialized equipment. Whether this is HDSDI for your high bandwidth, low latency transfer across your equipment. You may have a satellite transmission network, fantastic for global coverage, but obviously, I can't launch one. A startup can't launch one. All of this will commonly uh, result in files stored on a NAS, feeding your linear playout systems. And then, again, more specialized hardware, more single-purpose things with a transcoder, often built in a, a specialized device that's purchased as a standalone piece. Now, mapping this onto an OTT workload, 
Content will be ingested uh, regularly by FTP or an accelerator software. It'll be stored again on a NAS or a SAN and then managed by a digital asset management system or a workflow system or a scheduler. So let's start with the architecture of here. Everything starts with content and starts with the storage. A lot of what you'll hear today will be about storage first architectures. So the content providers will connect into my example digital asset management system, dropping files off. They may use Aspera, Signiant, Attunity Cloud Beam. They may just use S3 multi-part uploads. You could use import export. I would have Snowball up on here, but I don't have a logo for it yet. But for large asset ingests where you're building a new platform, you may also use Snowball. The files get dropped off into an S3 bucket. And what this allows you to do is mimic something very similar to an OTT system's traditional architecture. Using multi-tiered storage for cost management and efficiency, and lifecycle policies, their equivalent in S3. Using infrequent access storage within S3, you can massively save your costs. You can also then push after, let's say, 180 days, those same files to Glacier. You're reducing the amount of online storage. You're allowing yourself to still keep those files readily available if you need it. So the files have hit S3. Now we actually need to do something with them. And thanks to S3 notifications and Lambda, we can do this without actually having to have a watch folder. Within Lambda, we can receive the event from S3 that says, hey, my new file is here. And you could even say, actually, my files all come in pieces. I get a mezzanine file, a 50 megabit asset, and then afterwards, I'll get my manifest. So once all of my files are there, Lambda can take those files. It can process and extract various pieces from that metadata, read the sidecar files, and then persist that data into Dynamo. This then gives you a very simple, very easy way to store all of your metadata. And you could also push that same information into Cloud Search, allowing you full text search and other pieces across there. Now, you'll need to actually know where those files are, and you'll need to do processing on those. So at the same time, Lambda can say, don't just take the metadata. Also create proxies, small, low-quality pieces, which can be used in your digital asset management system to scrub through, make sure you have the right file, take thumbnails for embedding in uh, player pages, et cetera. And at the same time, to allow me to access this, well, I don't need to run a server here either. I can use a digital asset management system built in S3 with static pages, calling API Gateway through to Lambda. Lambda can then connect to DynamoDB, make cloud search requests, and all of these pieces aggregated in a single aggregated serverless digital asset management system. So great, I've got my files. Now I need to do something with them because, well, I've still got those high quality 50 megabit assets. I don't have anything that I can deliver to end users yet. So I'll talk about preparation and encryption and encoding. There's quite a few challenges here. First of all, you've got multiple devices. You need to process today for iPhone and tomorrow for set-top boxes and a new device comes out, it's a new launch, or the software has changed, and you need to re-encode or repackage everything. You've got higher quality content coming in. It was pretty scary when we first went to 3D, now talking about UHD, 4K, and 8K, and these files are getting huge, and the processing of these is getting a lot more complicated. You may have to do as many as 10, 20, or 30 different transcodes for a single video. And for those that come from any kind of content background, uh, content drops are frequently unevenly distributed. Perhaps twice per week, we'll get a drop of a series or catch up. And what this results is in a very peaky and trophy load. So again, storage first. My content comes in from the content provider and drops into S3. I get my S3 notification. That hits Lambda. Now, at this point, rather than using a workflow system or a WFS, what I can do is say, OK, I will now pass part of this job over to a transcoding piece or a packaging piece. You can either use the Amazon Elastic Transcoder or one of our partner products, such as Elemental or Harmonic or Zencoder or Encoding.com. And the resultant files can then be stored back into S3, into that same bucket. Once they're stored in there, a further S3 notification can be sent. 
And that can then call another Lambda function, which takes that data, takes the data about our newly transcoded assets, and puts that straight into a CMS. So if you already have a front end or a portal, you can integrate this very seamlessly and say, hey, here are my new files, here's my asset URL. Now, there's a term in broadcast, golden eyes and golden ears. Uh, these are people who know frame level problems in a file or they can hear slight feedback. I am neither of these, but they're very useful for you because they pick up problems that you wouldn't otherwise notice in your encoding. And frequently they'll say, hey, there's an issue with this file, you need to get it transcoded. And a very common way to do this is to just drop the file back into the drop folder, into the watch folder, and run through the entire process again. But if I'm dealing with 30 or 40 output files at 8K resolution, this doesn't scale. So why don't I just put API gateway in front of that same Lambda function? I can uh, hook that into my same CMS or asset management system. And at the point where I want to say, retranscode this, all I need to do is make that API call, and I can start all the specific preset to be retranscoded. So that's the encoding. Well, there's also packaging. There's the taking the encoded file and actually saying, here is how I can consume it on a device. We started with RTMP. Almost everybody had Flash Player installed. It was easy, it was very quick to market. But RTMP is hard to scale. So we're making a big move towards HTTP delivery. And to be honest, we're pretty much there. There are only a few devices that still say, hey, I must have RTSP, I must have RTMP. I put the words battle of the standard on here when it comes to HTTP, but it's not really a battle. It's more like a, a war of attrition. As new devices come out, as they support certain things, we see the, the uh, take up change as well. There's the newly formed Alliance for Open Media, of which Amazon is a part. We are working on a unified file format for the next generation of video delivery that will allow you to take a lot of these scaling challenges, a lot of the multi-device strategy uh, issues, and combine these into a single format. And with packaging comes encryption. Now, most of this is driven by the studios. The studios say, I've got my high quality content, it's my premium assets, it's my keys. You can't allow these to be watched by those who are not authorized. So almost always the studio will mandate certain pieces about your encryption and your DRM. One quite interesting piece is just-in-time encryption, but it's really hard. Encryption is a lot lighter than it ever has been, but at the same time, that workload on a million users concurrently is very difficult to manage. And when it comes to DRM platforms, we have just as many as we have packaging methods. Luckily, there is reusability. And we can say, for instance, use PlayReady across both HLS from Apple and also uh, SmoothStream from Microsoft. But there are problems with this. What happens if you've had a uh, platform for the last 10 months, 12 months, and suddenly a large browser drops support for a certain type of extension and your DRM no longer works? OK, I can see that's happened to a few of you. Now you've got 100 terabytes of post-encoded assets and now you have to reprocess them all. Because technologies are purely device driven, I have a phone today that supports HLS. Next year I might have one that only supports Dash. You see these changes in the way that people actually consume content and it affects your platform more than you realize. So keep your mezzanines, keep your high quality masters close. With most of my platforms now I'm recommending as soon as the asset has been encoded the first time, put it straight into infrequent access. For those that are, haven't seen the announcement recently, infrequent access for S3 means you pay a little more to retrieve it, but the storage price is a lot lower. And if you think about your requirements on re-encoding, it's actually a very low percentage. Make sure you use Glacier as well for that long tail and integrate that with your digital asset management system. It'll be much easier for you to pull back five years of content that way rather than loading in from tape. You can mix and match the actual encoding methods here. And what I mean by that is, if you've got a large amount of content you need to retranscode, some of it may be better to do by a output minute encoder, such as Elastic Transcode. Some may be better to do with a partner product like Harmonic or Elemental, as their models are slightly different. I'm going to contradict myself. I said don't do just-in-time packaging, but actually in some cases it does work. If you have geographically dispersed platforms, you're pushing across the entire world just-in-time encoding is difficult. However, if you're doing to a single geography, 
and you know that you can have a very strong caching layer in front of that, actually it can be quite safe. And this gives you the flexibility to store more raw files and not have to worry about re-encoding later on. And there's an 80-20 rule, or in most VOD platforms, it's more like a 95-5 rule of 95% of users accessing about 5% of your content. Remember this when you're choosing your storage weights and also when you're actually building out your uh, origin services. I want to just point something out with uh, CPU-based encoders. On our larger instance types, the c 48 x large and the m 410 x large, you have control over both the C and P state of the processors. What these allow you to control is the uh, frequency of a core and also the sleep state of a core. This is by default configured for highest throughput. But what this results in is variability in the timing of an individual core and also losing the L1 cache as your core goes to sleep and wakes up. Now, for most workloads, this does not make a difference. So please don't change it without testing. However, for encoding workloads, anything which is timing-based, frame-based, you can often get small errors introduced or an overall drop in capacity. So baseline with your application and make sure to very, uh, verify and test that encoding. But do have a look at that if you are looking at running your own encoders on AWS. And thank you to PocketMath, one of my customers out of Singapore, uh, for bringing this piece to my attention. So that's on the processing. I've got my assets stored in a DAM. I've processed them, I've encoded them, I've encrypted them. Now I need to get them out somewhere. I've talked a lot so far about file-based, video on demand, catch-up. So I'll just quickly go over live and the differences in the architecture there. With live, it's very common to have RTMP ingest into an origin server. This might be Wowser, it could be Nginx running the RTMP module, all going into a live streaming server. This is repackaged and encrypted on the fly. It's not usually DRM'd because there are no files persisted to a disk. And with this piece, it's getting increasingly common to see people using WebRTC. Now this is more for the user generated piece. It's for the Twitch style streaming. WebRTC is a new uh, technology which is peer to peer. It's very common in video conferencing. But because it doesn't involve a server piece, it does allow us to very cheaply scale out uh, user-based communications. So we can use this in doing streaming one-to-one, -one, one to few and then have player logic and server logic that says, okay, well, now there's 30, 40 viewers. Switch that to HTTP delivery. All of this is with live. On the VOD side, it's file-based. You'll commonly store your files on S3 or on a CDN storage. Some people choose to run their own origin, but it's difficult and hard to scale and frankly full of problems. Files are encrypted and stored in a final format. There is often very little at edge reprocessing required. DRM is there by default. And with all of these, the high bandwidth, and to be honest, this applies across both VOD and live, ISPs are getting increasingly worried about the unicast delivery of this. They look at multicast and they know that. Many of them are telcos, many of them are TV operators. But unicast delivery is obviously a bigger scaling problem. So I'll talk about a couple of streaming technologies. HLS from Apple and HDS from Adobe. HLS was pretty much de facto. Most people knew how it worked. Most people uh, put it on their devices. But we're seeing that the space is mixing up as AMPEG Dash comes in, for instance. And both of these have some things that you need to consider when you're deploying it in the real world. So I'm going to start with uh, HDS, but I'll talk quickly about how these both fit together. They both take a parent playlist, child playlist, and then chunk or fragment model. With an HLS, you have a parent playlist for each channel or each asset. That then contains a chunk list for each of your individual bit rates, and within those chunk lists, is a list of the, uh, sorry, within the chunk list is the files that you will access. In HDS, there's a manifest. That manifest tells you again where to get like a mid-tier file. And then finally, the fragments themselves. Now with HDS, there are a couple of challenges specifically with regard to live streaming. In this case, you can see I have a very simplified view of what a bootstrap file looks like in HDS. Uh, just a quick note, HDS is a binary protocol. So when you see the bootstrap files, you can't just read them in a text, text editor. 
So in this case, we have uh, fragments 55, 56. Now, something happens. Maybe I restart my encoder. Maybe I trip over the cable. Uh, maybe something completely outside of my control. There's a blip on the internet. I get rerouted, and my, repub uh, my stream restarts. This results in the enumeration of my fragments restarting as well. I go back to one. At this point, my player actually goes, oh, well, I just have 56. I'm going to wait for 57. And this means that the player never actually continues. So you keep waiting and you keep waiting, and your users get very frustrated. They refresh, and it comes back, and they're like, oh, well, this service isn't very good. So take note of how this works in your application. <clears throat> in the event of a republish, align those fragments or force a refresh in the player. But there's another piece to this. And just to go back to here, all of these uh, demonstrations here are single bit rate. If you have multi bit rate, you need to make sure that these same numbers are actually aligned across your different bit rates. It's very common to have two bit rates aligned and one not. If, it's, if it is that case, when I go to the player and I press play, the first 10 seconds will play brilliantly, and then my player will just sit and spin. People get very frustrated with this, so please be aware of that. So I mentioned that Bootstrap is a binary format. My previous employer and also customer SwiftServe uh, have a Bootstrap decoder. There's a link to GitHub on there. Feel free to use that if you do need to decode any of those files. So that's on the HDS side. Let's talk about HLS for a minute. This may look very familiar for anybody who spends a lot of time reading RFC 2616. Uh, I do. What we have here is a simple HTTP conversation. We have a GET request and then the headers. If you look at the two highlighted pieces, first of all, there's a 200 OK. What that means is, hey, there's no problem with this delivery. And then we have a last modified time. Again, RFC 2616, section 13, states a lot of detail about cache heuristics. That caching heuristic says that if an origin doesn't tell me that I can't cache a file, then I might. I might choose to do so based on last modified. The problem here is in a live stream, if you have a cache that you don't expect as an operator, this can often cause problems. And if you think about what a ISP is trying to do, it wants to reduce bandwidth, it wants to reduce transit. So it will keep as much file, as much in the network as it can. So when using HLS, make sure to use a cache header on your manifests, on your bit rate, uh, sorry, on your chunks as well. On the manifest file, it's pretty common to use a, say, five second cache header. You can also choose to use no cache header at all. There's one further thing to be, piece to think about. If you have 100 segments, and then after that you reset back to one, well, once per 16 minutes, that will result in your fragment name being reused. Now, as an ISP, I might say, well, these files look quite large. You know, each file is one or two or three megabytes. So I'm going to cache that for one hour. If I do that, as an ISP, the users that are consuming these streams will see the stream looping every 16 minutes. So you can also use segment name randomization, append a hash or an MD5 to the end of that to make sure that you don't get this repeat. And of course, with all of this, have a look at player metrics, work out which are your problem ISPs, which are your problem CDNs. Now, if you find a problem CDN, what do you do about it? Well, using a multi-CDN solution might be one way for you to do that. There's a couple of schools of thought. You can build one yourself, you can buy one, and there are some really good ones available. But often that CDN decision has to be tied into your metadata, and your metadata is coupled to your platform. So using a third party can be a little difficult. So just to go over the uh, approaches there, first of all, you have DNS-based. I hit cdn.vodplatform.com, and based on my resolution, uh, my resolver, I will get one or another CDN. I might make this decision based on geo. This uses in China, this uses in the US. I might make it based on latency from that resolver. Or I could even use a partner product, for instance, a company like Sedexis, who can do intelligent routing to the AS level or to the subnet level. But all of this is DNS-based. It means that I need to have the same file URL across all of my CDNs, and that's often not possible. So I could do asset sharding instead. 50% of my assets on this one, 50% on that. 
But this doesn't give me the flexibility to respond to issues live, because often I'll have to update my entire CMS. But every VOD platform has some sort of asset info service. So why not tie it into there and make that piece CD anywhere? So just to talk about that and look at what that piece is, I press play on a cat video. It makes a request to an asset info service. That will then give me a stream URL, an M3 wait. It might do some authentication and authorization. And then my player will go over to the CDN and request that file. Now, this is a great place for us to sideload some pieces of data in. You will do a get request for a, an asset URL. I will get that back. But I could also, for instance, load in different ant providers based on the country. Or I could even do country codes to do geo restriction. For instance, if I'm not in the Isle of Man, Singapore, or Indonesia, my player will actually say geo block here. So you're familiar with this architecture. I've put it up three times now. Once the file's ingested, you've got that data. You have the metadata in DynamoDB. You know how this fits together. So why not tie this in to that same asset info service and say, OK, 40% of my users go to CDNA, 40% go to CDMB. All of this can be joined together using S3. S3 acts as the single authoritative source of assets across all of these pieces. And actually, don't even run a server at all. Do this piece with Lambda, an API gateway. This is a very simple, contextless, easy to swap out piece. So I've got my files in DAM all the way through to encoding, consumption. So now I need to think about the player and how people will actually watch. And the piece that I've chosen to talk about here is around concurrency management. Concurrency management is something often given to us by studios or by the business. The studios will say, sorry, OTT operator, every user can only watch this twice, or at the same time, two streams. And as a business, what you want to restrict is cross-account sharing. You want to make sure that in the event of me sharing my account with five people, it doesn't exceed limits. So there's some pretty common approaches with this. Player heartbeats or subscription-based thresholds. And the way those player heartbeats work generally is my player, my device, sends a small packet of data. In this case, it'll go through to Kinesis, and maybe I do some Lambda functions on there. It's easy to implement in basically any, uh, any kind of player, as it's just responding to a device, uh, an event, every five seconds, every 10 seconds. The data in this will look generally like an asset ID. That might be the full URL. It might just be a, a small hash. You'll have a user ID or something identifiable about me. Then you'll have a timestamp, how far I got through this asset. But also, we can load in extra bits of data, the device ID itself, so something, a unique fingerprint, or the device type, you know, Amazon Fire or my iPhone or any piece like that. And now we've got this data, so what can we do with it? Well, it's going into, let's say, DynamoDB. We keep a common state of what each player is doing out in the wild. At this point, our license server can actually make a decision, and it can say, well, Alex has five streams going at the moment, and he's only permitted to uh, watch four. So I will stop issuing new licenses. I can make that decision entirely in the DRM server. All of this can be done very simply as well, because you've already got the data coming in from that player. Now, if you've got the data coming in from the player, what other things can you do with it? Well, for instance, you could track drop-off. I get halfway through an asset, and I'm like, it's not really that interesting. Shut down. You can highlight popular bits of content. They love this bit so much, they rewound and watched it again. Or you can also say, many people fast-forwarded past this piece. They didn't like this scene. They found it too gory, too violent, too not funny. They skipped through. You can feed this back into content development, storing it in Redshift, and allowing analysis over the top of that. From a business point of view, you can syndicate this data live from DynamoDB streams into an ad server. You can make a decision not just on the demographic of European male under 30, but also skip this section, watch this section. You can make more intelligent ads decisions there. And you can also do recommendations based on demographic. So this feeds into Redshift. It feeds then into <clears throat> machine learning and gives you a wider composite for how you make this decision. Now, you can do good as well as evil with this piece. You could decide, my users are already sending me this data. I'm going home. I'm on the subway. And well, I press pause. And I put my phone in my pocket. 
and I want to watch it later on. When I press play on my laptop, why doesn't my player just make a call to the same system and say, hey, has he been watching anything recently? I'm on a different device. That same state can then be synced back to the player, and the player will then go, OK, here you go. He was watching this far, this asset, this timestamp. And if we want to em enforce business rules at this point, it's quite easy to say concurrency management here. Without DRM, you can easily apply the same subscription, the same tier management there. So at this point, I'd like to hand over to my co-presenter. Video will talk a little bit about Go90 and the Verizon platform. Thank you, Alex. Morning, afternoon. For probably those of you who attended the party last night, it's more like an early AM, I guess. <laughs> so I wanted to talk about Go90. This is a new mobile-first, over-the-top service from Verizon, recently launched, just a couple of weeks old, available in the App Store for phone and tablets. I have a few screenshots here just to introduce the product to you before I dive into the architecture. It's um, basically a social network built in. Users come there, sign up, set up a profile, follow content, follow other users within the platform. And there is a social feed that's populated with the content that interests you the most based on what others are watching or what you have been doing within the application itself. There are a couple of interesting features that the application has. Uh, there are, uh, there's a concept of crew. It's more like a private chat room where you can have conversation about a piece of content. Or you can clip a piece of an asset that interests you and share it out to the external social network. I urge you guys to go check it out. And that's really about the marketing pitch. I'll stop there, and I'll talk about the architecture now. So coming back to the same pipeline that um, Alex introduced to us, I want to focus on the three green boxes here. Um, and the focus is going to be more around how we built the backend web services platform for metadata ingestion delivery, and how do we handle user data. At a high level, its uh, backend platform is comprises of about a couple of hundred independent services or systems. They range from client-facing services to ad platform to big data platform. Many of these services go through deployments on a weekly basis, so it's a constantly changing cloud environment in AWS. Verizon being Verizon Wireless, which is probably what most of you are familiar with, it's about 100 million customer base. So that's the primary target audience, though the app itself is not restricted just for Verizon customers. Um, the expectation is the platform is highly reliable, available, it's snappy to use, so the APIs need to respond really, really fast. So let's start with the um, API backend services. What does a typical stack look like? It's a JVM-based stack. We are heavy users of uh, Scala. Pretty much all of the services is Scala code. Play and spray-based web frameworks. And the boxes that I have around here are uh, a design pattern that we have used to think about solving common problems across services. So if you have to instrument your application to generate app-level metrics, if you have runtime configuration elements you want to pass to the service instance, how do you handle setting log level and consistent policy on rotating the logs? How do you do service-to-service -service communication? These are common problems that every individual service has to deal with. So we, as a team, decided to have common libraries that we generate that all the dev teams use and that has worked really well for us. Some of these uh, libraries are open sourced as well. I urge you guys to go check out OnQ and GitHub. It uh, looks a little cloudy, but I'll go through this architecture in steps. This is really a pretty high level view of the entire backend stack. So moving from the left, the expectation on some of the client-facing services is that they 
have a very low latency and very high availability. And as you move to the right of the deck, some of the back-end batch systems can tolerate a little bit more downtime. The entire stack is running on EC2 instances. We, uh, uh, we use Autoscale Group, ELB, no surprises there. Route 53 for managing our DNS entry points and where we need additional failovers, we use Route 53 and set up uh, additional SRV records as well. We do health check at the ELB layer. As I said, we are a JVM um, stack. So one of the common problems we see is our Java process dying. So doing the health check at the ELB level has allowed us to face in new instances, and we use the hook to take a core dump and analyze later what's going on with those. Let's deep dive, go a little bit piece by piece and talk through the different architecture and the design pattern here. My focus is on this session is primarily going to be on the um, systems that are client-facing, um, that which serves the user requests. When it comes to video and audio, Alex covered a lot about that architecture. It's primarily the storage pieces, and I'm not going to be talking about that other than saying that it's served through CDN. <laughs> so when it comes to these edge services, what, what is their goal? Their primary goal is to ensure that they talk to the internal systems, take the data back, do the business logic, and really uh, service the client request as quickly as possible. That's really the goal. When it comes to taking the data and serving the client request as quickly as possible, we need to ensure that there is an ability to cache. We have done really well just doing instance level caching. We don't really have a lot of complexity needing any kind of distributed cache. And that decision has eliminated another piece of infrastructure that we have to operate and understand in our system. It's worked really well for us. And depending on how different the client user experiences are and the API and the data needs are, we create one of those edge services. So those 100 plus microservices that I talked about are really all hidden inside. They are not exposed to the client directly. And it's really these edge services, which are not true to REST, these are really more APIs that are geared toward how the application needs to get access to the data set from the backend system. One design pattern, important thing to keep in mind on these edge services is um, they need to really not be dependent on systems that have failure endpoints. So for example, the governor that I listed here, which is our Go90 application-facing edge endpoint, has no persistent store whatsoever. It's really all done at the back end microservices. This is free of any kind of persistent store dependency. There is also a need as these instances come up to cache majority part of the catalog and serve it to the client. So as the first set of instances come up, they talk to the back end system, fetch the catalog, store it in the cache, and write it out to CDN. So as this um, cluster scales out, the new instances that come up actually fetch the data from CDN to bootstrap themselves rather than expecting the backend system to be up. So we have had instances where the catalog system goes down and it became really hard for us to bring new instances up. So that, again, putting the design pattern and eliminating any infrastructure dependency at this layer is really critical. These instances also run on instances that support um, enhanced networking. At load, that's really critical and important. It makes a world of difference. So primarily, it's uh, C3, C4 class instances when it comes to this and the next layer. So let's go through the layer below. This layer is all about these independent services that have a specific purpose. When it comes to DRM service, it only cares about who has access to what type of keys and serves those keys. When it comes to the profile service, it knows how to manage user profiles, the social graph behind that, and that's pretty much all that system does. Search system, for example, again, is something that um, knows how to serve the catalog data to the requests that are coming in, and that's really all the domain that that service does. 
so on and so forth, right? There are lots and lots and lots of these little systems in the back end. And some of you who are building microservices for a similar domain probably can catch similar terms that you probably are using or naming your systems as well. The picture doesn't look this pretty in runtime, right? At runtime, the dependencies are a lot more complex. You have all sorts of interactions going on between these systems. Back to the pattern that I talked about in the common library, one of the library, the service-to-service -service library, we have spent a lot of time getting that right. That library does one important function, and that is circuit breakers. Oftentimes, at scale, your dependent system that you're calling to is either slow or not available. How do you deal with timeouts? How do you deal with retries? How do you put a back-off strategy in your retry so you're not DDoSing your own, your own system? That has happened to us, too. <laughs> so these kind of things to think about and do it is really important across all services. So solving it once and using it end times has worked really well. We have extended the same service-to-service -service library to do things like our A-B testing, experimentation at the services layer, canary deployments as we build, take new builds and take them to production. So it's really worked out well for us. The next layer down is the persistent layer. Probably no surprise here. We are heavy on using NoSQL database. Majority of the critical systems um, microservices that I talked about use Cassandra database. We started off using um, DynamoDB, primarily two reasons we had to get out of Dynamo. Uh, at the time we were using, Dynamo did not have support for secondary indexes, and some of the item limits in the database were uh, hard for us, so it kind of made our application logic much more complex than it needed to be. So we kind of phased out of that and started using our own uh, Cassandra deployments. Outside of uh, Cassandra, there are a few other data sources or databases that we use. No surprise there, there is a S3 icon. Things like metadata images or people profile images. S3 is a great store to store them and serve out of CDN, so we use that. Our search metadata cluster is Elasticsearch. That's another Thing that we operate and we have optimized it for scale. And I'll talk about Mongo use case in a little bit in the context of metadata. Again, back to the common library pattern that I talked about, we don't just expose the Java driver for Cassandra at our application layer. We have wrapped it with our uh, library, our own library, an abstraction layer. And there are two primary things that this layer gives us. One is if the nodes are not available or slow, how do you deal with that? Back to the circuit breaker concept that I talked about on the S2S case. And the second thing it does is really metrics around the Cassandra performance and the latency. We have built our own monitoring infrastructure that allows us to take these and be able to set up alerts. So this library solves it in one place that all the services use. The last layer is really the backend system. Some of these gray boxes are not single services. They are fairly complex workflows. These backend services all, you know, serve also as a system of truth, especially in the case of the metadata. We, don't, we can lose the front-end systems if we want, and from a DR standpoint, it's very easy for us to get to a known state back from the backend systems. That's not the case for a lot of the user-generated data, but from the metadata standpoint, the backend systems access, system of truth. So I will talk next about these two pieces of um, the infrastructure. Let's start with metadata. How do we ingest, how do we store, how do we deliver metadata? What's metadata? It's a, it's a very common term, so I just wanted to make sure that we are in sync when we talk about metadata. If you're familiar with IMDB dataset, that's what I'm talking about, metadata. There is a title, there is a work of art, there is a description of a movie or a TV show or a video show that comes into your system. There is possible rating. There are actors, artists, cast and crew type of information. This is one of my to-do lists to watch this weekend. How many people watch this movie? Is it good? Recommendation? Good? 
trois. Few. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. So the left side is data flow, right side is image flow, and I'll go through these in steps. Again, this is a system that scales with content, one of the very few systems that just scales with content and has no user impact whatsoever. So let's start with the content types that Go90 supports. Um, the video on demand content is probably the most familiar. Um, different studios give different content to us. And when I talk about live content, I'm talking about live music shows or live sports that's going on. And the linear side of the content is the, your Comedy Central, ESPN, NFL games that we carry in the platform. What do we do to ingest the metadata within this content? There are primarily three sets of workflows that we go through in bringing this data set into our front-end systems. One is a programmatic workflow that is constant updates and schedules that go on with this metadata. So there's a programmatic workflow that goes through and processes this. And there is a content operations workflow. Not all studios are equal when they send the data to us. The images don't look very good. Sometimes there are typos. Sometimes there is missing description. So we have a content operations group that has a user interface to consume, look at the catalog, curate the content, fix the content, and push it on to the front-end systems. There are other things that are needed for the operations as well. If you look at the application, you will see specifically curated set of content that we push to our users, our recommended content. So that is the merchandising and the promotional workflows that goes through this pipeline as well. And then last but not least important is our provisioning workflow. That basically says, who can watch what content and for how long? That's your grants, your rights, your license, whatever you want to call them. The layer below is codenamed Nile for a reason. Our earlier ar architecture used to be schedule-based, and we had a lot of trouble ensuring that we had um, constant flow of these data sets going into the front-end systems. So what this layer does is take the raw data, normalize it, combine it with the curated content, stages to push to the front-end systems. And the next layer is river, as, as you can imagine, Nile River. So what that does is there is a search river that takes the data that's ready to be discoverable. And these are Mongo databases, by the way. So we basically read, listen to the ops log changes, and these processes run as part of uh, listening to the changes that are coming through the ops log on MongoDB. All this does is takes the data, combines it with the grants of the content, and pushes it to the front-end systems. And since people follow content, they want to be notified of interesting things that comes to them. So there's another workflow to take it to the feeds of the users as well. We have taken the same approach to also build additional rivers. One good use case is what is the user watching uh, is a front-end analytics problem. How do you, on the back end, ensure we correlate that with the uh, catalog index IDs, for example? The image workflow is fairly straightforward. It's auto scale group based workers that spin up and down based on how many images hit our system. Sometimes there is a lot, sometimes there is none. So these are just EC2 instances that we run, takes it to S3, serve via CDN. Let me talk a little bit about the BI pipeline. Four separate pipeline here. Let's start with the data collection. The goal for this pipeline is to take the data from the device and the services to the backend systems as quickly as possible. We have a primarily a Kafka pipe that's running on Mesos. We have we use Kamu, which is EOL by LinkedIn, by the way, so we're looking into moving to their newer version of the library. That runs in um, EMR. All that does is consumes these events out of Kafka and pushes it to S3 as quickly as possible. At scale, this, there are a few challenges um, in, in this pipeline. right? So we have done a couple of things on the client side to batch the event request so you're not hitting the back end for every event that needs to get out. And we also have adopted an Avro format uh, for a couple of reasons, helps us to have a schema to quickly validate the payload before it's sent up, and it also gives a much more condensed form rather than pushing raw JSON all the way to the back end. 
Batch processing reads from S3. We have simple workflow orchestrated jobs for doing things like who's watching what, how do we segment our users, how do we do quality of service around how many black frames are showing in the phone, do we have audio video sync issues, these are things that we compute and once the data is computed, it goes to our Redshift for reporting and analysis. And we also pass the data out to our monitoring pipeline, which is Elasticsearch backend with Kibana dashboards. And we have a homegrown solution to set up alerts and threshold from that solution. The third pipeline is our real time. That's Spark cluster running on Mesos. We use both Marathon for long running jobs and Kronos for bad jobs. Things like computing popular content, what's trending in the platform, is done through this pipeline. We have used the same pipeline for also running some of our machine learning algorithms for recommendation. So if we are computing, a, there is a more like this rail you'll see if you navigate to a content. We don't want to sh recommend the thing that you just watched. So we want to be able to get access to that data set and filter it in real time before we push that or publish that to the application. So those kind of things happen here. Again, the same story. Goes to uh, Data Warehouse, and it also um, goes to our monitoring infrastructure. Redshift has worked really, really well for us. Scale's beautiful, fairly stable, so I highly recommend you guys to look at that as a Data Warehouse solution. With that, I want to wrap up with some of the best practices. Do invest on a load testing infrastructure. It's really important. It's really important to understand how the APIs get used from your application, rather than poking every little API and trying to optimize it to the core. So what we have done is thinking through how the application calls different APIs, think through them as a scenario, as a whole system, model them in our load test, and then go and optimize the bottlenecks. That's the only way to go about it. Deploy often is something that I really urge the dev teams to do. There is a tendency to keep the code working perfect in the laptop, and then they get surprised when you push it in you know, AWS distributed system. All of a sudden, it behaves very, very different. So how do you build that muscle to deploy often? Even if the feature is not used, it, there is a, it's a good habit to actually take it out and put it in a representative virtualized box and see how it performs. Microservices as a buzzword or a pretty architecture is good, but just thinking about how do you do de development and how do you do deployment at scale of these systems, it's really helpful to think about systems as separate things. Also helps in resourcing and staffing and planning as well. The last one is a good one. Often we start talking about, oh, I have this perfect database for this perfect use case that we have, and I want to use this for my system is how the conversation starts. And when we talk about what does it take to operate it at scale, and what kind of skill set and what kind of things we need to build as part of that, then we start making the right trade-offs. So always keep that in mind on how you're going to do this, run this infrastructure at scale in AWS. Those are mine. I'm sure Alex has his own set of best practices he would like to close out with. So invite him back. So with that, I'll just summarize and try to wrap up the two pieces. So all of those are brilliant, and that's based on actually doing it. But from the pie in the sky, wouldn't this be perfect if everything worked the first time? If you can, go serverless by default. As Werner said in his keynote yesterday, no server is easier to manage than no server. Where you can avoid lock-in, try to avoid committing to a technology that will result in a large operational overhead some point down the line. Be cautious of the outside. Uh, by that I mean be cautious of other things, other pieces of your delivery that you can't control, whether it's an ISP network, whether it's a player, whether it's a device. And if you can, if you've already got data coming into your platform, reuse it for good. Use it for giving your customers more features, allowing them to do different things. And with that, please do go build. Get in touch if you have any problems. Either talk to your AWS people or find me on social media and stalk me or do any piece like that. And with that, I shall say thank you and uh, allow you guys to go. Before you leave, 
please do remember to complete your evaluations. And myself and Vidya will be around here or outside for the next five to 10 minutes to answer any questions. So thank you very much.